authors are really smart, insightful, that we have things to learn from them. The reason to emphasize the social context is not to try to discover how they were fooled or blinded by their social, social circumstances. The reason to emphasize the context, historical context in which they wrote, is to help us understand not what was going on behind their back, but what was going on right in front of their faces. So the social and historical context in which these authors uh, wrote are things that they were very well aware of, very well aware of. And understanding the social context, understanding the historical context in which they wrote helps us to understand why they were worried about the questions that they were worried about, what the resources available to them for addressing those questions were. And so the historical context will help us gain insight into what their views were. So it's not going to be a debunking or undermining uh, approach, but rather a way of helping to gain an understanding and insight to what they were saying. Okay, so I made all of this explicit because it's very important in the case of Hobbes. Uh, Hobbes lived most of his life in England between 1588 and 1679. Um, and the first half of the 17th century uh, was a period of several very dramatic historical trends. I want to mention a few of these to you so you know the social context. The first is um, that this is the period, as you know, of the development of what we think of as modern science, especially natural science. Kepler's laws of planetary motion were published in the first two decades of the 17th century. And then the next uh, period of time, the early 17th century, people like Francis Bacon and Galileo and Descartes all published works describing really more or less inventing what we think of as the modern scientific method. Newton, for example, was born in 1643, so just after this period that um, we're talking about. So it's a period in which modern science was being invented and having amazing successes, unprecedented successes in describing the natural world. This is a period, because of this, in which there were lots of new questions and controversies about science, about the scientific for example, how it relates to religion. There were questions about its limits and what it was able, what the scientific method was able to accomplish. Second big historical trend was that this is a period of the beginnings of early forms of capitalism, the beginnings of really market relations that were beginning to emerge and beginning to maybe chip away at the old established feudal order. So social theorists at this time were concerned about these new market relations. They were concerned about whether society, whether uh, the economic structure of the society could really function in this new way. Under feudalism, societies have been organized hierarchically uh, in a centralized way with, um, with authority being passed down from the top. And market relations, early capitalist relations, um, did not have a centralized uh, authority coordinating all of the different decisions. Under capitalism, under market relations, economic decision making is 
disperse among many different individuals. And so there was a real question among what we would call social theorists, whether society could hang together in that way. Doesn't it need a centralized hierarchical authority in order to work? Uh, to avoid chaos, there needs to be this um, hierarchy. So as new market relations, as capitalist relations began to emerge, there was this question about um, society holding together, the organization of society. Third, the Catholic Church, which had simply been Christianity for 1,500 years, was now split into apparently irreconcilable and often warring factions. Each one, Catholics and Protestants, claiming to represent the true path to salvation, each one holding that their opponents were condemned to eternal damnation, um, and often, as I'm about to explain to you, in a state of war with one another. So this, of course, is the result of the Reformation that's classically said to have started in 1517, um, with Martin Luther. By the, the, by the end of the 16th century, um, m most of Europe had chosen up sides, either Protestant or Catholic, and most of Europe was on the brink of war. <coughs> the church, Catholic church, and its allies tried to put down these revolts. Protestant revolutionaries were trying to overthrow this hierarchy. Um, and from the mid 16th century, last half of the 16th century, until um, well, really early until the 18th century, Europe was more or less in a continuous state of warfare. So, for example, during the Thirty Years' War, was in what's now Germany, so this was 1618 to 1648, 30 years before. That area, what is now Germany, lost around one third of its population, something like 8 million. So to get a sense of the scale, that would be something like the United States losing 100 million people. Okay. Um, so warfare is more or less a constant threat and pretty devastating. Okay. And fourth, not surprisingly, during this time of religious warfare, there was also extreme political uncertainty and instability. So it's important for us to remember that at the time, political concerns were very closely tied up with religious concerns. And part of the reason for this um, was quite simple, because the traditional justification of monarchy, the traditional justification for political organization and political rule, was divine right. The theory that the monarch, the ruler, was God's representative on earth, and that he or she was entitled to rule because of God's authorization. So when there was sharp religious disagreement, as there was during this period, obviously there's going to be sharp political disagreement as well. So the great hope for reconciliation, the great hope for peace and some measure of toleration Catholics and Protestants was Henry IV of France. He issued the Edict of Nantes in 1598, which granted uh, religious and political freedom in France to both Catholics and French Protestants. I'm sorry, what's that? Henry IV of France. So the Edict of Nantes was 
a very important uh, and symbolic moment of toleration and hope for peace between the Moor and the Catholics and Protestants. But Henry himself was assassinated in 1610, and um, I just mentioned the Thirty Years' War that started in 1618. Um, the war, the war, the Thirty Years' War ended in 1648 um, with the Treaty of Westphalia, um, and this treaty was, at least symbolically. Um, what established what we think of as the modern state system, the modern system of nation states. Um, after 30 years of this completely devastating war, this treaty said more or less that each country, each state, gets to decide what its own religion is. So the prince, the monarch, whoever it is in a country gets to say what the religion will be in that country. And other countries are not allowed to try to go to war to get them to change. So the, the thought was no country should interfere with the internal workings, the internal decisions of other countries. So this is the um, idea of the modern state system where each country has its own domestic decision making that's separate from the, uh, the influence or force of others. So this of course was the theory of the um, peace or treaty of Westphalia. In practice countries continue to invade each other of course. Uh, but symbolically at least this was an important step in the direction of toleration, in the direction of religious toleration. But I want you to notice that it was, you know, even in theory, only a first step. It did not require internal tolerance. It did not require that a, that a state practice toleration internally. So each state gets to decide what religion it's going to have in its country without others dictating it. But within a country, there's no requirement that other religions be tolerated. A country could be as brutal as it wanted to be in suppressing dissenting religions internally. But um, in theory, at least, there was external toleration. Okay. So let me say just a little bit more about Hobbes' specific circumstances. Um, 